Well, all Neighbours fans, the moment draws near. As I'm talking to you, engineers on two continents here and down under in Australia are plugging open air in via satellite to one of the most famous front rooms in Ausland. Hello, Neighbours. Hey. Hello. Oh, they can hear me. <laughs> Success. 1987. The UK is in the grip of an obsession with the land down under. On BBC One's daytime phone-in, Open Air, the cast of new Aussie soap opera, Neighbours, are about to meet their adoring public. Jason Donovan, who plays Scott Robinson. Is Jason there? Yes, see you yep. there. Guy Pearce, who plays Mike Young. That's me. <laughs> He's there too. Hello. Right, that's good. <laughs> Kylie Minogue, who plays Charlene. Yes, hello. Good, hello, hello Kylie. We're going to get a phone call now. Catherine, who's calling from Edinburgh. Everyone's from Scotland today. Catherine. Hello, um, I'd just like to say how much I really enjoy Neighbours and it's absolute cult viewing in the sixth year common room at my school. Catherine isn't alone. For millions of Brits, life on Ramsey Street in the fictional Melbourne suburb of Erinsborough makes for essential daily viewing. 23 million people were watching Neighbours. The population of the UK was 60, 65. Now that's one in three. Everybody I know watched Neighbours. And I remember like even in the summer when like there'd be those occasional times where you'd be in the park or you'd be out rushing home in the evening because you had to get back for Neighbours. And it had a certain sense of escapism about it as well because, you know, it was sunny and gorgeous in Melbourne. The weather was always great there. I was lying on my parents' bed watching it in their bedroom and I was scared to even blink in case I missed a moment. Since it first aired in 1985, a who's who of future Aussie superstars have called Ramsey Street home. Russell Crowe, Guy Pearce, Liam Hemsworth, even Margot Robbie. But for most of us, there's always been a clear favourite. Ladies and gentlemen, Kylie Minogue. <laughs> Kylie Minogue. <laughs> Kylie Minogue. <laughs> I'm Scott Mills. You're about to listen to brand new era's Kylie Minogue. To hear longer episodes with vintage Kylie anthems and performances from the BBC archive, listen on BBC Sounds. Kylie Minogue. Kylie to her friends. Yeah, it's an Australian name, and as I say, I, it means boomerang. Like her namesake, she always comes back. In a career spanning five decades, Kylie's racked up an incredible 52 top 40 hits. David Tennant. That's what her legacy is, isn't it? More than appearance in Neighbours. That's almost a footnote now in what has become this sort of extraordinary cultural movement that is uh, embodied in one small Australian person. And she's showing no signs of slowing down. Padam Padam sort of happened almost out of nowhere. I'm walking down Soho and I'm hearing it in every bar, in every car. In this series, we're celebrating an artist with a flair for reinvention. A bubblegum pop princess, an indie provocateur, a goddess in gold hot pants, and a disco diva who never fails to pack the dance floor. Alongside new interviews with some of Kylie's biggest celebrity fans and fellow musicians, we're diving deep into the BBC archive to bring you the story of her incredible career so far. Just in time for a headline set at Radio 2 in the Park in September 2023. So let's start at the top. A casting company in Melbourne were looking for a young girl for the TV show The Sullivans, which I'm not sure if that ever played here. On BBC Radio Manchester, Owain Wynne Evans spoke to Kylie about her first foray into showbiz. Well, both my sister and I auditioned for that. Um, so I got that role of a little Dutch girl called Carla. The Sullivans told the story of an Aussie family during World War II. Here's a clip from the show made by Crawford Productions, which was first shown on Channel 9 in 1979. You are English pilots, not? Papa and Mama knew many English people. Papa used to go to London for his business. Sometimes we went there for holidays. That is why I go to school for I learn English. Random fact, before I actually filmed The Sullivans, the production company called and asked if I could do one episode of a TV show called Skyways, which I did, and Jason Donovan played my brother. So I worked when I was 11 and then a bit when I was 16. I think 16 is when I really fell in love with acting and performing and then finish school and then you kind of know the rest from Neighbours. On Neighbours, Kylie played Charlene, a girl next door type with a penchant for dungarees and the Southern Hemisphere's blondest, curliest perm. Charlene was the ever so sweet budding mechanic 
Singer Beverly Knight remembers her impact. Charlene was cute and bubbly, but feisty as well, you know. She knew her own mind. And I think as a young kind of adolescent growing up in those times, someone like her was someone I could relate to. But it was Charlene's relationship with Ramsey Street heartthrob Scott Robinson, played, of course, by Jason Donovan, that really thrilled Neighbours fans and took the show to another level. The Scott and Charlene wedding, I remember it to a T. Along with 20 million others, a young Fern Cotton was glued to the screen. And the next day at school, me and my friends were just dissecting the whole thing. But we were just obsessed with Kylie and Jason. It was such an iconic moment and one that I will not forget. And offset, the rumour mill kept the focus on Kylie and Jason's real life relationship. But the pair were reluctant to indulge their curious public. Well, the papers have been full of the fact that in fact you're romantically involved. Mm -hmm. Depends which paper you read. Yeah, it does. It's different days, it varies. But we find that without knowing it, it's been the best publicity machine we could have ever wanted. We didn't expect that or, or try to try to make that happen. But, you know, we've we, um, denied it and denied it and there's no point because, you know, even some TV shows we do, the, the interviewer will say, ah, oh, well, no one's going to believe you. Of course, they were actually together. But Kylie was already learning to navigate the tightrope between life as a public star and private person. I knew early on that if you're in the public eye and you are known as yourself, then reason says people are interested in, in your private life. So I've always allowed some of that, you know, there is a grey area. Mm. But behind that, I've got the safety knowing that my real, real private life is endless. No one can touch that. It's one thing to walk that line as a soap star, but the scrutiny that comes with international pop stardom is a different beast. In the late 80s, Kylie was about to learn that lesson the hard way. At the height of their early fame, the cast of Neighbours had been booked to perform a benefit concert for an Aussie Rules football club in Melbourne. It was a, you know, a very casual concert, so we performed one number and after that we were backstage and we were all like full of adrenaline and so excited and I think it was the first time that any of us really had performed live on stage. So we wanted to do another song and we had nothing prepared so I said well why don't we do Locomotion. Originally recorded by Little Eva in 1962, that improvised version of the Locomotion went down a storm. It was the July of 1987, the same month that Scott and Charlene's wedding first aired in Australia and Kylie's star power could no longer be denied. Aussie label Mushroom Records picked up the locomotion as Kylie's debut single. Here's Kylie on the air with BBC Radio Manchester, thinking back to her first big musical break. I'm still very good friends with the guy who ran the record company then, and I asked him not too long ago, I said, come on, tell me, what did you think when you signed me for that one song? Because then it was very like rock bands. Certainly his label didn't have any kind of fluffy pop like me. And he assures me it wasn't a joke, but he did <laughs> give me a little insight, like a little peek behind the scenes, like you're saying, that he asked his kids, he said, what would you think if Kylie Minogue released a record? And it kind of fell on deaf ears. They weren't really that bothered. And then he said, you know, Charlene from Neighbours. And then they picked up and they went, oh yeah, Charlene, we love her. <laughs> so it's interesting to look back that they didn't actually know me, but they knew Charlene. So that's how my very first record came out. Following the track's retro roots, the locomotion was originally given the big band treatment, but the fates intervened. As it happened, sound engineer Mike Duffy was on loan to Mushroom Records from London. More specifically, he'd come from the studios of UK super producers Stock, Aitken and Waterman, home to Dead or Alive, Rick Astley, Bananarama and other quintessential late 80s pop acts. As an engineer, it was Mike's job to remix what was already recorded. But, sensing an opportunity, he started from scratch, crafting a pitch-perfect synth backing that captured the spirit of the moment and put Kylie's bubblegum vocal front and centre. The locomotion was a huge hit in Australia, where it stayed at number one for seven weeks in 1987. Stock, Aitken and Waterman took notice and flew the pop princess out to London that same year. 
Producer and label boss Pete Waterman remembers the start of their iconic collaboration. I mean, you know, obviously we started working with her when she was 18 and nobody in those days ever thought that a television star could be a pop star. I mean, that was the, the beauty, I suppose. There was no pressure on us because nobody thought we could do it. But if the hit factory wasn't feeling the pressure, Kylie certainly was. Owen Wynne Evans heard her side of the story. Do you remember recording that song? Firstly, they would have to write me out of the show for two weeks to write Charlene, you know, I don't know, she's away working or I don't, I don't know how they did that, so that we could fly to the UK. So time was limited. So we came over and there's various versions of this story, but it's something like Stockacre Warden was, was so busy at that time. They forgot we were there or Pete Waterman forgot to tell the team. We were ignored for however many days it was, best part of a week, until the last day they had no option but to get us in. I still think that Mike and Matt, the two, two of the other members of Stockhead Warner, only found out that day that I was coming in. So legend has it, Pete was like, you've got to write a song for her, she's got to do it today. And someone said she should be so lucky. So that's where the title came about. Oh, I know. And they wrote it in record time. I had, you know, just was kind of thrown in there and recorded it and pretty much got on the plane and didn't know what would happen what would come of it and um yeah and that was the start of uh, my relationship with Stock Ake Warner. I Should Be So Lucky was a little slice of pop perfection and the first single from Kylie's self-titled 1988 album released on Pete Waterman's PWL imprint. The record was a huge hit with British teenagers who couldn't get enough of the music and the Kylie merch. Fern Cotton. <laughs> I was a member of the Kylie Minogue fan club. Back in the day, we actually had to write in to become a member of a fan club. It took great effort. You couldn't send in some sort of email address or write an online form. This was actually going to the post office and putting a stamp on a letter to become a fan club member. So each month, or maybe it was every quarter, I'd get a letter in the post, which I thought was like personally from Kylie, and like a badge and some stickers or something. I thought it was the best thing in the world. I probably still got them in the loft somewhere. For actor and Kylie mega fan Jamie Winston, it was all about that look. I was a big Kylie fan and I can't remember the exact dates, but I do remember like wanting to put my hair up in a scrunchie and she was the first person to make me kink my hair. She was the first person to make me want to wear short dungarees. Soon, it was pretty clear that Kylie had outgrown neighbours after two years on Ramsey Street, it was time to put Charlene out to pasture and focus solely on the tunes. Leaving a safe, high-profile gig came with a massive dollop of risk, but Kylie's never been one to play it safe. In July 1988, on the promotion rounds for her debut LP, Kylie consoled a distraught Terry Wogan. We read that you've, you've left Neighbours, that you're going to leave Neighbours. Yes, I've, I've well, left we have, about... You're about 18 months in front of us in yeah, Australia. Yeah, so not for a while. I'm afraid you'll have to put up with uh, me for a bit longer. Yeah. Um, I left about four weeks ago and I haven't been killed off, so... You could um, come back. Yes, it's open for me to return if I wish to do so. Keeping her options open seemed like a smart move. Soap stars have made the same transition in the past with varying degrees of success. Do you feel that that's a a wise thing for you to do after all it is the whole center of, of, of your fame I know you've made it as a singer and all mm -hmm. that kind of thing but if you, do you think maybe if you give up neighbors you'll slip away a bit on it um, I would hope not but uh, it's there for me to go back if I want to which is nice and reassuring to know and at this stage I'm really not sure I'm concentrating on the next couple of months but who knows Charlene would return to Ramsey Street just the once for a special appearance in 2022 but back in 1989, even Kylie's fans were unsure if she'd stay the course in a post-Neighbours reality. Sunday's smash hits awards are the most prestigious in the world of pop. The magazine's young readers are notorious for ditching yesterday's heroes while they're still being fated elsewhere. Cathy McGowan went to talk to the events organisers and one of the favourites. Why do you think Kylie Minogue has caught the imagination of the public in such a big way? I think one of the main factors, certainly when she started, was that she was a really popular character on the television. And it'd be interesting to see what happens to Kylie when it stops being on the telly, because that's such a great promotion for, you know, a character or for a pop star is to be on the telly every day in a very popular role. If she wanted to make it, to be the artist she felt like she could be, it was essential that Kylie established an identity outside of Charlene. 
That meant working hard. An endless carousel of promotion, recording, videos, photo shoots and world tours. She had to devote herself completely to the dream. It worked. Her second album with Stock Aiken and Waterman, Enjoy Yourself, went to number one in October 1989 and spent 16 weeks in the top 10. Around that time, Kylie spoke to Radio 1 about her success so far. We've pulled this conversation from the darkest depths of the BBC archive. I'm thrilled to bits about that because that's something that I've come to really believe. You have to enjoy yourself. I mean, I, I do get, as most pop artists do, a lot of criticism and a lot of untruths written in the paper and so forth. So you just have to laugh at different situations and make the most of it. And that song, Enjoy Yourself, is fantastic. Um, it symbolises what I'm about. I mean, you know, if you don't like this music, don't listen to it. If you do, go on, go for it. Dance to it, go crazy, just enjoy it. In the same year, she landed a role in a controversial new movie, The Delinquents. It was a conscious move away from her squeaky clean image. You've got a new film called Delinquents coming. That's going to change yeah. everything. Because that's a tough part, isn't I it? I think so. I'm not sure what the rating for that is yet because obviously it's, it's not 18. cut together. Might not be. Might be. Well, actually, I read in the papers I'm doing this triple X film, mm. which is a lot of rubbish. I wouldn't do that. But the film does deal with some uh, delicate subjects. And I think it will change. I mean, it's nice to know that I can do other things than what I've done so far. You think your fans will, would prefer you more mature? I think that it's good to move with the fans. I think if you move too far in front of them, they'll say, whoa, what's going on? I mean, she's growing up, but um, yeah. my fans are growing up too, so... Yeah, I mean, it's deliberate. It's deliberate policy for you to, to move your career forward a bit. Yeah, definitely. I think you've always got to think about moving forward and, and have some idea of where you're going. Kylie was growing up, but artistically, Stock, Aitken and Waterman still held all the cards. You're going to write any stuff? Uh, not at this stage. I think there's, a, there's always a lot of pressure. People say, OK, when are you going to write? And I think that if an actor can take what's written for them and take direction and uh, have a producer, I mean, all they're really doing is saying the words. I think a singer can do the same thing and yeah. just sing. Kylie's dealt with her share of critics. While millions bought her records, sections of the press dismissed her as a singing budgie, or in Lloyd Grossman's case, a cardboard cutout. Well, 15 minutes can be a long time, especially when you spend it listening to the work of that Melbourne nightingale, Kylie Minogue, who's also here with us today. All five foot one of her, alas, only in two dimensions, but who can tell the difference anyway? And that whole period was, shall we say, an interesting time for female artists, particularly female solo artists. I know I was one of them. Beverly Knight remembers the expectations and assumptions that dogged female pop artists at the time, both from the press and from within the industry itself. You must adhere to what you're being told. Here's a song, sing it. Even if you'd written the song, here's your song, but it must be represented in this way. You don't have lots of say. There was a hell of a lot of assumption about female artists, that they were much more about the packaging than the content. In 1989, one of the cornerstones of Kylie's early fame, her relationship with Jason Donovan, came to an end. There was a lot of reasons, I guess, and if the truth be known, the decision was hers to move on. A new and famously controversial relationship with In Excess frontman Michael Hutchins gave Kylie a different perspective on her music. At the time, the tabloids hounded them, obsessed with speculating about the private details of their relationship. But it laid the foundation for a creative rebirth. Speaking to Michael Parkinson in 2002, Kylie remembered their time together as a period of transformation. How did he come into in your life and what did he do for you? I met him at a point in my life where I was just ready to, to look at the world and it was like he took my blinkers off. He was the closest person in my life at that time and such a uh, well I was so impressionable and was more than happy to, to be guided by him there was a time before we started seeing each other he'd said he was in the studio and I think it was uh, de rigueur at that time to kind of slag me off as much as possible and I think I came on the television and so I, the people in this room were giving me a hard time and, and he recalled the story to me saying he stood up and said no 
I like her. I think she's really cool or nice or whatever he said. But saw something in me. He just nurtured me. He never told me what to do. Never said, you know, this is the way you should perform or these are the decisions you should make. But just absolute belief in me. By 1991, Kylie was still in her early 20s, but she was starting to push against her old image. In the video for Word Is Out, the first single from her fourth album, the world got its first real taste of Kylie as sex symbol. But pop music is often fickle, and Stock Aiken and Waterman's high energy synth sound was falling out of fashion. Rave culture had gone mainstream, and with the first stirrings of Britpop, the UK was on the brink of Cool Britannia. Facing a world where top 10 hits were no longer guaranteed, Kylie Minogue and Stock Aitken and Waterman were starting to make for an uncomfortable fit. But if you're smart, determined, and have faith in your own ability, the end of one era opens the door for another. A chance to find yourself. Kylie, you're quoted as saying that you've spent the first 10 years of your career pretending. I probably said something like that. And yeah, there was a time very early on that um, a part of it was like pretending, going straight from acting in a soap into being part of the PWL Hit Factory. You, there was no time to, to evolve, really. It was just being put on the, the, you know, the, the production line yeah. and being, doing what you were told to do. And so within that, I had to, to try and grow up and find myself. Next time on Era's Kylie Minogue, we'll dive into a misunderstood period in the life and times of the UK's favourite pop princess. There was an expectation that she would burn very brightly in this very sort of almost trashy pop world for a while and then inevitably die away. And certainly some of that slightly more experimental stuff that she did, the indie period, if you like, I think took a lot of people by surprise. An era of self-discovery. We were hooked on the Madonnas and the Cyndi Lauper's and kind of the freaky girls back then. So Kylie didn't start standing out to me until later in the game. And then I thought, who? Oh, Kylie, she's hung in there. Not only has she hung in there, she's grown as an artist. And a time of unlikely collaborations. She was instructed, I think, I believe, by the people around her, don't go near this guy. You just don't want to be associated with Nick Cave, especially back then. There was a potential for disaster for both of us. That's next time on Eras Kylie Minogue. For a more in-depth look at Kylie's eras, head to BBC Sounds, where you can hear a version of this podcast in spatial audio and packed with Kylie's music and exclusive live performances.